And what happened at Edwards Air Force Base in 1980? In 1980, an SR-71 spy plane was flying from Edwards Air Force Base out to Area 51 for a test mission. There was a new pilot on, on board, pilot and co-pilot, and he was going through some testing, uh, training, qualifications, or what they call standboard evaluations. Anyways, we took off from Edwards Air Force Base. The SR-71 got up to 65,000 feet, and it was be just a few, uh, I think, 27-minute flight from Edwards to uh, Area 51. But as they reached 65,000 feet, they encountered a UFO, a huge UFO, as the pilot described it as being as large as two football fields. Now, this UFO was flying around the aircraft. Now, you got to understand that the SR-71 is flying as straight at about 2,200 miles an hour, and this UFO was flying around it, making it look bad for the pilots, thinking that every time that UFO came in front of it, the SR-71 was going to crash into it. This happened for, uh, from the time they reached 65 and still until they started their descent into uh, Area 51. Were they ordered just to keep that position? They were notified the base. They went on the secure channel. Uh, they were talking to Edwards Air Force Base. They are ta talking to the secure channel, explaining what they're seeing. And the first thing that the ground controllers told them to do was, open your cameras and let's take some pictures. And that's what they did. They took over 100 pictures in that short time period. Of course, they have advanced cameras on, on board the right. SR-71. But every time that a UFO got under the SR-71, they Perfect. took a picture of it. So they had this entire UFO on camera. Everything about the flying part of it. Plus, uh, some people don't know, and of course, the uh, SR-71 no longer fly. I think there's one that still flies for NASA, but they're obsolete now. And most of the information about the SR-71 is, is not classified anymore. But one of the things that people didn't realize was not only did the uh, SR-71 collect photographs, photographic intelligence, they also could collect ELINT, electronic intelligence. And that's what they were doing. They turned on their ELINT collectors, and the signal and collectors, signal intelligent collectors, their frequency collectors. So they had everything on. All their spy equipment was on. And so they were collecting every bit of data that was coming from that UFO. And eventually the UFO flew away. The SR-71 landed it at well, Area one, 51. That's one test drive I don't think that pilot will ever forget. No. In fact, we met him. We met him at a UFO convention. Wendell Stevens knew him. He sat down and he told us his story. And a lot of questions that we threw at him, some of which he could answer and some of which he couldn't. But then we went out and tried to get this through FOIA. The Air Force admits the flight number, the SR-71 tail number was on that mission on that particular day in 1980. And the flight plan but the only thing the flight plan said it was at, from at Edwards to a classified location, which, of course, we know was Area 51. And the only thing the Air Force would say, any other details will remain classified. That's the FOIA yep. information that, that Wendell Holmes shared with us. So that incident, even after, you know, 40 some years, it's still remaining classified. If mining and slave trade is part of, you know, this galactic commerce, where does our Navy fit into this and our space program? Well, that's a good question, especially in view of recent events since Bell died, when we've officially announced there is a space force. It even has its own flag. But my feeling is that Bill's view was related to the, the, the Solar Warden thing, which started with the Navy but it's not clear to me at the time that he died, it was only the Navy that was controlling that. Because I think that the Solar Warden program was 
really representing the good guys trying to make sure that certain kinds of alien craft were not intruding into our our sphere of influence. So they weren't part of that slave trade is what he no, told you. No, they're not. They were trying to protect, protect. us against evil aliens mm -hmm. uh, and promote harmony amongst uh, friendly aliens. Right. Well, we do have a clip from uh, William Tompkins about this galactic slave trade. So let's take a look at it. Okay. It's very strange that this has been going on, that the same structure of uh, a medieval country, uh, kings, queens, princesses, all of the top people uh, agreed with maybe France's or Spain's group and they became the elite. They became the control of the population in their countries and were never allowing the people a real life, uh, never allowing them to participate in many of the upper things. And many of, to be, many of them were actually slaves. So the big slavery business out there is a big business. It's a major business today, a massive business. Anything that you want to manufacture, anything that you want to farm, anything that you want to build, uh, it's all done with slave uh, uh, people. And uh, in Germany, uh, Germany had massive underground facilities that were all slaves. And even to the extent that when the decision was made before the war ended, that they were going to continue all of their extraterrestrial developments on UFOs and on every weapon system that they were building, they took the production facilities to Antarctica, but they also brought the slaves with them. So now they're slaves underneath the ground, in, uh, and they still are today in Antarctica. Um, but slave business out there is a big business. And this is happening today. It's not something that happened 100 years ago. This has been going on a long time. And that needs to be fixed. And uh, there's all kinds of slavery. There's sexual slavery, unbelievably. There's many different classes of people that are abducted for slavery, sexual slavery. They want the tops and the smartest, and because they're worth more. They have, I think, four or five different uh, levels of people that they abduct. Uh, they abduct uh, top medical research people. They, t they, they abduct the uh, 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 corporate levels, and they abduct the, the most brilliant levels, and then they go down through three levels, and that says where they get uh, sectioned off. Everybody gets to two planets, and then it's de decided where they're going to be sent to. And uh, But it's a massive business. It's been going on for years, and uh, uh, we can't identify where these people have gone. And just like normal abductions, uh, we don't know where they went. But because most of them don't come back. We're only hearing from the few that came back. Shocking, to say the least. But where did he extract his intelligence from for this? That is a superior question because it's the question he never answered to me. You know, he talked about slavery in very global terms and to some extent specific terms, the different kinds of slavery, but he never talked about the questions I wanted answered, and, and that is, what were his sources of information for this, and why was he so confident that these numbers were, were valid? And I mean, the specifics of how he knew what he claimed to know were missing in our conversations. So I w was very informed to see his articulate presentation, but very frustrated to realize that, that the questions I want answered 
which was how do the, what's the process involved to make the slavery happen, uh, the, those questions were not answered. The U.S. Navy is not doing this. They're protecting us. Yet here on planet Earth, we have people, you know, that he's claiming uh, slavery down in Antarctica right now. So why are they not being protected? Well, we don't have control over what the reptilians and the Nazis are doing in Antarctica. Well, there's slavery obviously happening on our planet. The question is, is it the humans? Is it the earthlings here, you know, conducting that? Is it another, you know, extraterrestrial force? Really, Bill and I didn't speculate about that much. I do know, though, that there are have been some times when he's been asked questions, not by me, but by another interviewer, where his response was, I can't tell you about that. And so always in my mind, there's been a question of, well, what is it that when he was told by Admiral Webster to Bill tell it all, what is it that he now or when before he died felt he could not speak of? And, and I have never figured out, I thought about three or four possibilities. One of them might have been the details associated with But just occasionally, there is physical evidence to back up reports of close encounters. On the morning of November the 9th, 1979, forestry worker Bob Taylor walked down this woodland track outside Livingston New Town near Edinburgh. He rounded a corner and was astonished to be confronted by an unearthly object. It was a huge thing with a big round dome, a very dark grey colour. And it had a, a big flange going all the way around. I could see arms sticking out of this flange with what I took to be blades on the top. Later, he described what he'd seen to a local newspaper artist who drew this sketch. As I stood here, there was two balls came out, two balls. I think they'd be about three feet in diameter with about six spikes. And they were rolling on these spikes. And they came right up beside me. And I remember feeling a tug at that time. And a very powerful smell, a choking sort of smell. And that was it. He crawled up this path and staggered home to be met on the doorstep by his bewildered wife. He looked terrible when he came in the door and he just stood at the door and I said, have you had an accident with your lorry? And he said, no, I've been attacked. And I said, what with? And he said, a spaceship. And I said, oh, goodness me, there's no such a thing as a spaceship. I'm going to phone the doctor. You must have fell and hurt your head. He looked quite shocked, and he, he was drained, he was right white, and his face was dirty, and he had a red scar here. And uh, his clothes were all dirty, and his trousers, and then he told me his trousers had been torn. Police station, Barkhead. The police were called, and they discovered inexplicable track marks at the scene of the incident. On examining the area, I found two track marks approximately 40 holes in the ground. And these are the track marks here, and these are the 40 holes. Uh, since then, I've photographed the holes. This is a photograph of the hole here. This is the holes that measured approximately three and a half inches. And this other photograph here, you can actually see the trade marks which correspond to the marks here. These markings and tracks were actually inside this area here that's fenced off, uh, and there was Definitely no other tracks leading to or from this area. These are the trousers worn by Mr. Taylor. As you can see, they're of fairly heavy material. We have a tear on the left, just below the pocket, and one on the right trouser leg, again just below the pocket. These marks are consistent with the material having been pulled up while the trousers were being worn. Well, I'm pretty certain that, that day that 
I saw a spaceship sitting here. We must accept the story of Mr. Taylor. He is a very highly respected member of the community, a man of high integrity, and not one likely to invent such a story. A Perth family claims it's been confronted by a UFO while crossing the Nullarbor. Their story is being backed by other motorists, and the crew of two South Australian fishing boats have also reported being buzzed by a UFO. Faye Knowles and her three sons claim an orange blob picked their car up off the highway. They fled in terror into the scrub until the object disappeared. For the Knowles family, it was to have been a routine drive across the Nullarbor. That all changed as the family approached the town of Mundrabilla on the air highway. They claim that's when they had their unexpected and terrifying encounter with the unknown. The car was shaking. Um, I went down the window and I said it's on top of the roof. And all this, I don't know what it was, it all come inside the car like the snow. We thought we were all dead. And I went down the window and Mum said there's something on the roof. And I said, no, come off it, you know, you've got to be joking. And she went down the window and she put her hand on the, on the roof and she goes, my God, she goes, what is it? And I, no, I swear to God, I'm not lying. I swear to God, I opened up my window, and the car started going out of control. And all this smoke, and it was like smoke. I'm not, I'm not lying, it was like smoke. And gases all started coming out. And me and my brother started to go crazy, you know. I thought it was going to hit my head. Felt like my brain was getting sucked out. Another motorist and a truck driver also witnessed the incident. They confirmed the Knowles family story. Police are investigating the claim. They say the car did have dents on the roof and an ash substance inside. Late today, the Knowles family returned to the scene of their experience for the last time. And uh, you won't travel that stretch of road again? No way. You, you, don't don't even, you don't even wish to travel in your own car? No. Rod Stephen, 7 News. It seemed to just hover there for a couple of seconds, and I went past it. And uh, I looked in the rear vision mirror, and it came in behind the bus, and then it stayed around about a kilometre behind me. And Peter Chapman kept driving but alerted five other passengers who were awake. They were stunned and frightened as the glowing three-metre sphere chased them. In January this year, the Knowles family from Perth claimed their car was buzzed and then lifted into the air by a similar object. Peter Chapman laughed off their claims, but Monday morning's experience has changed his mind. In four years of driving this road, he's seen nothing like it. And I didn't believe it in it at all, that's UFO stuff. But I do now. It's totally different. Unfortunately, no passenger could find a camera aboard to capture these few moments on film. Dead Horse, Alaska, February 9th, 2023. High above this remote oil drilling outpost, the United States Air Force detects a mysterious, unidentified flying object on radar. A pair of F-22 Raptor fighter jets are immediately scrambled to intercept the UFO. And the pilots report seeing a strange, cylindrical, silver object floating in the sky. And then the official statement was, we deemed it a threat to our airspace. We take those threats seriously. We shot it down. It's not a concern anymore. That's the end of the story. There's a strange object hovering over Alaska. But the government never revealed what it was. Was it from China? Was it from Russia? Or was it a flying saucer? What was the mysterious UFO that President Biden felt needed to be shot out of the sky? But this is not the first time a UFO has come to the attention of America's commander in chief. And many people are convinced that US presidents have been hiding the truth about extraterrestrial spacecraft for more than 70 years. Washington National Airport, Washington, D.C., July 19th, 1952. Air traffic controllers detect multiple unidentified objects flying in the sky over the nation's capital. July 19th, 1952, squadrons of UFOs flew over the capital. They flew over the Washington Monument. They flew over the White House. Harry Truman was the first president to actually set American policy having to do with UFOs. And here's what he did. Immediately, the explanation for all those UFOs over Washington, D.C. in 1952 was radar anomalies, temperature inversion. The pilots weren't sure what they were seeing. So will the president say UFOs are among us? Absolutely not. Did the Truman administration cover up the truth about alien spacecraft visiting our planet? 
In the 1950s, many Americans believed that the government was withholding important information about UFOs. And in fact, there are those who claim that America's next president actually met with extraterrestrials. Palm Springs, California, February 20th, 1954. President Dwight D. Eisenhower is on a winter holiday when in the middle of the night, he simply disappears. When you're president of the United States, we should know where you are at all times. But this one evening in February of 1954, Eisenhower just goes missing to the point where the Associated Press put out a wire saying he died. He died in the middle of the night. And then two minutes later, they retracted it and said, no, our mistake. And the next morning, he shows up at church. So something happened in the middle of that night that is obviously off the books, unexplained, and really strange. Where was President Eisenhower during the time that he disappeared? Well, according to numerous accounts that surfaced after the incident, Eisenhower allegedly attended a most unusual meeting. There's a story that on February 20th, 1954, President Eisenhower had a meeting with extraterrestrials. This took place at an airbase. Eisenhower was presumably asked to renounce and give up nuclear weapons. And in exchange, the extraterrestrials would give the US technology which would change the world. The story is that Eisenhower turned down this deal because he couldn't be sure that the Soviets would do the same thing. Did President Eisenhower really meet with extraterrestrials? Well, if he did, the government successfully covered up any definitive evidence. But in recent years, it's become harder to keep secrets about UFOs because multiple government organizations have been actively investigating this mysterious phenomenon. There have been several recent hearings on UFOs, both in Congress and with NASA. And so what we've seen is this subject increasingly moving out of the fringe and into the mainstream, which makes me wonder, what is it they're not telling us? The president, particularly in his capacity as commander in chief, can make that call and maybe we will see it one day soon. My fellow Americans, people of the world, we are not alone. The more you look into the UFO and ET reality, it becomes clear that we've had interactions through the whole of human history. Certainly when you look at the translations of the ancient Sumerian text, it becomes clear that we've had these interactions with the Anunnaki that supposedly genetically engineered the modern human beings. Some of the pharaohs may have been of an extraterrestrial origin. But they had advanced technology, a technology that generally we are not allowed to know about. But of all the pharaohs, the one that you would have to say most likely was to be an extraterrestrial was Akhenaten. He uh, always demanded that he was shown in his true likeness, which was very unusual for those of you who are familiar. You know, statues and uh, carvings of Akhenaten. Um, he has a really unusual body form, an elongated skull. What's even more amazing is that his children, as well, have these sort of elongated skulls that look very much like extraterrestrials or hybrids. The pyramids we see all over the world, then not just in Egypt, you know, some huge pyramids in China through to Bosnia, and of course the pyramids in Mexico. The modern era of ufology probably began with the Roswell incident, the crash of the UFO, the retrieval of the disc, the debris and the bodies. Now, it's estimated there's something like 600 witnesses that have spoken out now, first, second, and third-hand witnesses, about the real reality of the Roswell crash being extraterrestrial. And just one of those includes Colonel Phil Corso, a military person who has said he actually saw one of the bodies from the crash, and, of course, spoke out um, later, saying that he worked at the Pentagon, at the Army's Research and Development Department in the 60s, where he was tasked with seeding some of the technology from Roswell into mainstream industry through the government contracting programs. Was Roswell actually an accident, or was it like a Trojan horse event to deliver that technology into mainstream? In July 1952, we had over 500 UFO sightings 
in the USA, including about 70 over Washington, D.C. On the 26th of July, 52, there were 12 UFOs seen and filmed over Capitol Hill and the White House. And these were tracked on three different radar systems, including from Andrews Air Force Base. And then just a few weeks later, the first, the biggest uh, military exercise after the Second World War um, happened uh, towards the end of September in 1952. This was a major military exercise in the North Sea, Scandinavian and Baltic waters involving military forces from Britain, Belgium, Canada, with about 200 ships, 1,000 planes, and 80,000 men, including the USS Franklin D. Roosevelt aircraft carrier, which was the first ship to carry nuclear weapons. Now, during the maneuvers, there were many UFO and unidentified submersible objects recorded, including luminous triangular objects, disc-shaped objects rising out of the sea, and a quarter-mile-wide underwater object which was tracked following the carrier that then flew out of the sea. There's a major stumbling block that faces humanity, and that is that we're being told by mainstream media and astronomy that advanced life probably only exists on Earth, and there is no evidence for UFOs or ETs coming here. Meanwhile, looking at the actual abundant evidence of UFO and ET interactions, it becomes clear that not only do they exist, that they've been interacting for thousands of years, but also they've been communicating with us in many forms. This can be from physical contact with abductees, contactees, and certain military personnel, communicating either verbally, telepathically, or via projected imagery. So if we are to understand the motives and agendas of the different ET beings, we need to interpret these in communications and also learn how we can communicate back. ET human hybrids are living with us on Earth. They are here for such a good purpose. Some of the beings really want humans to sort of wake up and realize that we're not alone in the universe and there are all these other beings. And even with the incredible distances between their planets and ours, they do come here and they do interact with certain people. There are many, many different types of beings too. Some of them seem to be more self-serving. Some of them seem to be enormously benevolent, loving. Many people say, well, maybe we're all hybrids, all of us humans from, from way back. Maybe genetically we were very influenced by copulating with or in a number of different ways. And um, that our more primitive, shall we say, forebears who were combined with some of the extraterrestrial genetics um, have ultimately resulted in us being the way that we are. This is one of our hybrids, Jacqueline Smith. Uh, she is an animal communicator. This is one of the types of beings that she is composed of genetically. It's not exactly a little gray being. It's more of a cream-colored being. Because of her extraterrestrial components, she's able to do telepathic communication with other humans. Sometimes she tracks lost animals. People will call her in and say, my dog seems to be very distressed. And she'll find out what's going on. One of our English ET human hybrids, Charmaine, these are some of the beings um, who visit her. These looks are so deceiving. Most of the extraterrestrials, so many of the types, do not have the kind of musculature that we have in their faces. They cannot smile the way that we do, but the good sense, the friendliness that they get from these beings is more of a vibrational thing. This is her own drawing of the reptilian whom she has quite a bit of contact with. Charmaine herself has a, a lot of reptilian in her, and she's been able to shapeshift to her full reptilian form. Now, Jujuli Kita is holding a snake. She has quite a bit of reptilian, and she's very comfortable with all earth reptiles. She likes all animals and communicates with them. And they all respond very nicely to her. I mean, even a rattlesnake or any other poisonous snake, you know, if you know, she's taking a walk and one is there, they'll, they'll just come over to her. She's not afraid at all and rub against her leg and not bite her. 
They sense her comfort. You know, she'll go and make friends with the snake and set the snake into an area away from the population. She calls this being her reptilian queen. Uh, this being, she says, is very luminous. All these colors of light and frequency emanating from her. And yet you can see the texture, particularly of her facial skin, uh, is very, very different texture than our skin. And you see the more vertical slits in her eyes too. They're kind of like scales. Each one of these hybrids has a mission. They're here to help humanity. The idea that, that this object was a meteor. That's about as ludicrous as I've heard. Jenny, what's your overall opinion? Do you think it's possible the government covered up a UFO crash in Kecksburg? Oh, sure. <laughs> So why, why do you think that the government seems to still be hiding these close calls that we've had with UFOs? Because that shows our weakness, that we can't control or, or anticipate. That is going to mean that we're the victims. There was a bumper on the bottom part of it. On that bumper, there was what I call, it looked to me like the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. It was markings like stars and shapes and figures and circles and lines. And what it was, I don't know. So we're all standing around this thing, looking around, checking and everything, wondering what in the heck it could be. And finally, here come two men down through the woods. Gentlemen, you must leave the area. The site is quarantined. They were making a lot of phone calls, and they were standing around in groups talking. Oh, that's a Roger. We believe we've located the ravine. We estimate contact within 10 minutes. I have no idea who, who they telephoned. There was no calls turned up on my bill. Notify NASA, put them on standby, and uh, let the Pentagon know what's going the on. The village of Kecksburg, with a population of just 250, appeared to have been invaded, first from the sky, then by the United States military. I seen a box truck, a van-type truck, pull up there. There were some men come around the side of it. Uh, they were dressed in moon suits, we called them at the time. And they had a light-colored box, I'm guessing uh, roughly five foot square. At the end of the convoy was a flatbed truck with a large covered object on the back. John Hayes was only 10 years old when the truck rumbled by his bedroom window. What was on the back of it, I have no idea. It was about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle from the distance I was at. When Rudolf Hess witnessed Maria Orsic as she channeled his deceased friend, Dietrich Eckhart, he became convinced that she was the real deal. Rudolf Hess had served time in prison with Adolf Hitler, and they knew each other well. It's presumed that it was Hess who told Hitler about Maria Orsic, her channeling sessions with the light beings of Aldebaran, and most importantly, her flying discs. Famed scientist Winifred Schumann recognized that the flying saucer plans, channeled by Maria, closely resembled the work of Austrian scientist Victor Schauberger. It was just after Hess revealed what Maria Orsic was really up to that the Germans essentially kidnapped Schauberger and put him to work on the German flying saucers. But who was Victor Schauberger and what did he discover? Victor Schauberger was an Austrian inventor who uh, worked actually uh, during World War II with the Third Reich. And he's well known for his vortex mechanics. And he worked a lot with water vortexes. He was early on very interested in, in the way water purified itself in streams through, through natural swirling and, and whirlpools and things. And so the whole idea of what we would call vortex technology and in a sense using water, in this case, is, was really pioneered by Victor Schauberger. Victor Schauberger created an amazing vortex technology. He actually analyzed and studied fish in a stream. He noticed that trout were able to stand still in a moving stream because of the vortex of the water flow over their body. He analyzed the same exact thing in salmon who were swimming upstream. 
This vortex flow of water over the fish's body gave him the concept and idea to create a vortex-based technology that was fundamentally based off of pulling instead of pushing. So his actual technology would allow you to be pulled through space instead of pushing against space. Victor Schauberger's egg-shaped vortex-based engine became critically acclaimed. Eventually, a corporate conglomerate kidnapped him, brought him to another country, forced him to sign over the rights to his invention in order for him to get back to his family. When they did release him back to his family, he was found dead five days later. Schauberger invented a number of unusual items and devices, including a flying saucer kind of device that worked as a as a vortex, sort of flying a tornado vortex, similar to a gyro also. It's a curious with Schauberger's devices in that it's quite possible that an aircraft, particularly a flying saucer kind of aircraft, could actually be powered by water as the vortex. The issue regarding the, the Nazis and their flying saucer research is um, there is a basis in fact here. You know, we all know now that there were certain German scientists during World War II, I think most prominently Victor Schauberger, who were doing very interesting, uh, let, let's say brilliant, uh, let's say even genius level work on disc shaped airframes. Uh, Schauberger was a self taught genius who was then commandeered by the SS to work for them during the war. He did create disc shaped craft, uh, they were tested. In my mind, you have a similar thing with Victor Schauberger as with the ancient Hindu texts on Vimanas, which talk about mercury being part of the power system of these ancient craft. And supposedly using mercury would be also in a, a kind of a Schauberger type vortex, but you'd be using mercury instead of water. And mercury has many unusual qualities. It, it's an element, it's a metal, it's a liquid, it's a conductor. You can do things with mercury that you can't really do with any other metal or, or liquid or, or element, really. And that would be creating things like uh, mercury gyros. The mercury gyro would then be a, a sealed gyro with mercury inside it moving in a, as a liquid in a vortex or a, a gyroscopic kind of action. And then if you were to introduce electricity into that gyro of, of mercury, you would electrify that mercury and it would become a, a plasma, an electrified gas that's spinning in a, in a toroidal or, or gyroscopic type movement. And scientists have used gyroscopes for years as an example of, of artificial gravity and anti-gravity. So in a sense, a, a, a craft that's using this kind of vortex technology, especially one with mercury, is a very viable kind of uh, flying saucer type craft. And the other interesting thing about such a craft like that it was, is that once you introduced electricity to the mercury vortex, it's gonna light it up and the thing will be extremely bright. So you're, if you were to see this thing flying, it would be much as many UFOs are described, where they, they are this spinning top kind of gyro thing that's also very brightly lit, uh, sometimes with even lights that are uh, flashing or flinning, flickering or spinning along the edge of the craft. And this is exactly how a Mercury gyro would really uh, look like and, and act like. Well, the Germans were mounting expeditions all over the world in the 1930s because they were looking primarily for mystical devices. You know, their, their technology was very, very advanced. Their aviation technology was way beyond anything the United States developed. The ancients were fascinated with Mercury all over the world. Uh, the Chinese and the ancient Mexicans and Mayans and, and Mercury is that usually an offshoot of, of gold production, actually. But yeah, when you have the, the ancient texts, the, like the Vamana texts, Mercury is clearly talked about there. So Mercury was a very important thing for the ancient people. But Mercury is a deadly poison. It, working with Mercury, you shouldn't do that. Mercury gas, 
is completely deadly. Mercury needs to be handled very, very carefully and in a closed environment. So exactly what ancient people were doing with Mercury is, is kind of a mystery, although spacecraft and stuff is really the obvious thing to do with it, and, and, and other mining technologies. Mercury really comes from the, a mineral called cinnabar, and cinnabar is a Sanskrit word. So even, even geologically and mineralogically, words for mercury and, and cinnabar come really from ancient Sanskrit. Mercury too, in Western tradition, Mercury was the, the Greek god of, of communication. He flew through the air. And so you, with the ancient people, it would seem that Mercury and flight are very carefully associated with each other. Has the U.S. government become aware of actual evidence of extraterrestrial, otherwise unexplained forms of intelligence? And if so, when do you think this first occurred? Uh, I like to use the term non-human. I don't like to denote origin. Keeps the aperture open, both scientifically. Right. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, like I've disc discussed publicly uh, previously, 1930s. Okay. Can you give me the names and titles of the people with direct first-hand knowledge uh, and access to some of this crash retrieval, some of these crash retrieval programs, and maybe which facilities, military bases that would the recovered material would be in? And I know a lot of Congress have talked about we're going to go to Area 51, and you know, and there's nothing there anymore anyway. It's just you know, and we move like a glacier. And as soon as we announce it, I'm sure the moving vans would pull up. But please. Uh, I can't discuss that publicly, but I did provide that information both to the Intel committees and the Inspector General. And we could get that in the SCIF if we were allowed to get in a SCIF with you. Would that be probably what you would think? Sure, if you had the appropriate yeah. accesses, yeah. Uh, what special access programs cover this information, and how is it possible that they have evaded oversight for so long? Uh, I do know the names. Once again, I can't discuss that publicly and, and how they've evaded oversight. I. In a close setting, I can tell you the specific tradecraft used. All right. When do, when do you think those programs began and who authorized them? I do know a lot of that information, but that's something I can't discuss publicly because of sensitivities. All right. If any of y'all want to jump in on any of this, you're more than welcome to. Um, what level of security clearance is required to fully access these programs? Well, anybody who has... Uh, and, I, and I say that oh. because myself... Um, Representative Gates and Representative Luna were mm. basically turned away at one point mm -hmm. at Eglin. So please go right ahead. Uh, certainly a difference between member access and, say, somebody like me, but anybody who has a you know, TSSCI clearance and meets the eligibility criteria, the access adjudicative authority should be able to grant you so, access. So, yeah. uh, Ms. Bircher, if you'll yield. So just to be put a fine point on that, there's nothing that you're aware of that's above special access program classification. It's a misnomer that there's anything actually above top secret. Executive Order 13526 delineates the classification levels. Right. And, but I, I draw a point on that because we can have access to, mm -hmm. to those programs. And so the notion that we're not being given that access sort of defies our typical muscle memory here in Congress. Thank you, Mr. Burchard. I'll yield back to you. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Um, along those lines, Title 10, you may not know this or not, but uh, Title 10 and Title 50 authorization as they, they seem to say they're inefficient. It, so who gets to decide this, in your opinion, in the past? Uh, it's a group of career uh, senior executive officials. Okay. Are they government officials? Both or in and out. Do what? Both in and out of government, and that's about as far as I, I got can you. go there. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, that leads to my next question. Which private corporations are directly involved in this program? How much taxpayer money has been invested in these programs, to your knowledge? I mean, we know we, know we, we audit the Pentagon every year, mm -hmm. and I've been here five years, and they failed the dadgum thing every year. They uh, lose over a billion dollars a year, we think, and I've told the Department of Defense maybe 60 percent of their assets are unaccounted for, whatever the heck that means. In the public sector, you go to jail for that kind of crap. So tell me. Yeah, I know when I, um, I'm, I'm a dollar off of my DTS travel voucher, I get hammered, but it uh, seems like it doesn't work the other if way, you right? Sell over yeah. six, if you sell over $600 worth of stuff on eBay, now you get a call from the IRS. So, mm -hmm. please, what corporations? Yeah, I don't know the specific metrics towards the end of your question. Uh, the specific corporations I did provide uh, to the committees in specific divisions and 
uh, I spent 11 and a half hours with both Intel committees. So. Okay. Has there been any, has there been an active U.S. government disinformation campaign to deny the existence of unidentified aerial phenomena? And if so, why? I can't go beyond what I've already espoused publicly about that. Okay, I've been told to ask you what that what that is and how to get it in the record. What, which which uh, what have you stated publicly in your interviews for the congressional record? Uh, yeah. If you uh, reference my News Nation interview and I talk about a multi-decade you know campaign to um, disenfranchise public interest, Sorry, basically. Mr. Chairman, I've gone. Yeah. Thank I you. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I yield back negative twenty-one seconds. Well, we heard from an expert. Now let's talk to a witness. Christopher Bledsoe says he's not only seen UFOs, but he can summon them on command. It started when Bledsoe went on a fishing trip in 2007. He says he saw an orb that followed him home. And he still sees the orbs above his house to this day. He's become something of a psychological phenomenon. His experience is so compelling that both NASA and the CIA have studied his brain. Even the History Channel's documenting it. They filmed him IDing an orb live. Watch. He's pointing now. So maybe he's focusing on one. That would make sense. He has one. He's got one in the tree line. When we started seeing that intense effort, he spotted an orb in the tree line. Let's turn it over to Christopher Bledsoe, who personally witnessed UFOs. So, Chris, the CIA studying you, NASA studying you, the History Channel studying you. Tell Jesse Waters primetime the truth. You can summon alien orbs. Well, um, it's, it's, it's been happening for the last 15 years. And, uh, I, you know, I ask them to come and they come. And that's, I don't know why, but they do. And we've, we've I've taken 2,000 500 videos in the last 24 months, like you're seeing there. How do you ask them? I just simply say a prayer. That's all I do. And, uh, and they come. And do you think... As crazy think, as it sounds, that's how it happens. Do you think there might be something wrong with you? No, I don't think so. I think the government's trying to figure out why this, this is happening. They have been for quite some time. How did it start? Well, it started in 2007. I had, um, I was down on my luck. I'd lost basically everything. After the World Trade Center disaster, I had 100 houses, 130 houses a year I was building. I had 70 under construction. And Fort Bragg is where I live in that area. And they stopped buying houses. And uh, with... Uh, Interest rates at eight and nine percent on construction money. Then it was flying out the window so fast. I just watched it uh, in a slow motion train wreck, and it mm. got so that I couldn't even buy my children lunch at school after being successful for twenty years. So you were down on your luck. Yep. And um, so I was on the Cape Fear River with three other guys and my son, and they were fishing. I just took them there. I was contemplating um, everything. I was just, you know, I was thinking the worst thoughts, and I was crying out to, to the heavens, whoever's up there, I need help. And that's when I walked around the corner and up to the top of the hill, and these three big balls of fire was sitting about 300 yards away. And the next thing I know, I walked back to the fire, and it was close to four hours later. And there had been a manhunt for me, and I had no clue that any more than 20 minutes had passed. Unbelievable. All right. Well, listen, I hope these things are peaceful because you were summoning them all over the place. And yeah. uh, <laughs> they look like they're lighting up the sky. God bless you. And just tell them I'm, I come in peace. Thank you very much. <laughs> realize it because it's not enough of a difference to get our attention but in some of these cases that's what happens and then suddenly they find themselves back in their own reality one man wrote me that he went out to the airport watching the jets take off 
the little jets. As he watched them, they were going forward, and suddenly they went backwards. Then they went forwards again. Then they went backwards again. <laughs> and he didn't know what was going on, but he walked out to the street. The cars were doing the same thing. They were going forwards and backwards. And then when he walked down the streets, he saw the people in the stores were all dressed like they were 50 years ago. So I think it maybe it's kind of like on the edge of one of these time dimensions, and it was not quite set, I suppose. But can you see why they can't tell something like this to their friends or neighbors? They think they were crazy. And I've had some things like that where you'll be on the verge of these shifting and strange things are happening and you're not in one or not in the other. So it could really make you think you were going crazy. Now, we are surrounded by dimensions. We can't see them because they're vibrating at different frequencies. There are cities there. There are people there. I think this is where the different time zones are the past, the future, they're all vibrating at different frequencies. And the aliens know how to go back and forth in these frequencies. This is the way they travel. They don't travel so much with uh, fuel, as some of the other investigators used to give me a hard time. They wanted to know what kind of fuel do we have to have to go from here to the next star out there? And how many of the uh, speed of light? They said it's not done that way. The UFOs are held by thought. It can be the group thought of everybody on the craft or the individual thought. They have crystals on board the craft, and the energy is stored in these crystals. And this is what propels them. And when they want to travel from one place to another, they change the vibration of their frequency. They speed it up. And when they speed it up, they will go into the other dimension. Some people have seen UFOs in the sky at night they'll suddenly flash and disappear. And other ones will see one suddenly flash in. That's because they are changing the frequency, the vibration of the ship, and are hitting that a wall where the two dimensions clash, and they suddenly are over in the other dimension. Just like Star Trek, you know, when you see whenever they go into Mach 1, they suddenly just disappear. And I'm beginning to think that all of these time dimensions in the past or existing in the same way as a frequency, as a dimension. And when we were talking to Nostradamus, we were able to tune in on that frequency and communicate like having a telephone. And it is some way, it's like turn tuning a, uh, a radio or a television. Somehow we were able to communicate across time. They are doing the same thing. And this is why they are aware of everything that's happening. Some of the people who have come through, the ones that I'm working with, have told me they are from the future. Some of them are from very far in the future, and they are time travelers. And they said they come back to our time to try to change things that will affect their future. And that's why they're trying to change what we're doing right now, because it will affect their future. And they have to be very careful because if they change too much, then their future will cease to exist as they know it. This sounds like the sci-fi movies, but they say it is really happening. And many of these uh, travelers have told me things that they said I'm not allowed to lecture on, I'm not allowed to write about, because they said it's too dangerous. But there are definite, they say portals are windows in time that they're able to find and go through. And that's what our government is trying to find now so they can do time travel in the same way. I wanted to know what the difference was between the windows and the portals. They said a portal you can go through, like they do, and go into another dimension in the future, in the past. A window you can look through, but you can't go through. And it would be on the same dimension you are where the portals would be able to, ex to ex access the different dimensions. See, some of this can get complicated. But I want to tell you one thing that did happen that was really startling. Um, when I was on the Art Bell Show last year, it was Mike Siegel was the one who was doing the interview. And, you know, when you're on there, you're on all night long. It's four hours. I, be I got the strangest email from these ladies in Memphis 
They said rather than stay up all night to listen to the show, they're used to recording it. They have tape recorders that will record all night long on these very slow tapes. The next morning they got up, they said the one woman said she turned on the tape. Instead of the Mike Siegel show, it was a sporting event. And it was the same call letters as the right station. She knew she had the right station. But they called the station. Her other friend said the same thing. She had recorded it during the night, and they got the sporting event. They called the station. The station said, we're not carrying Art Bell anymore, and we don't care how many protests we get. We haven't carried it for several weeks. So they said they did not broadcast it that night. Well, the third woman who recorded the show that night got my talk on the radio. And they said on the end radio during the breaks, the same call letters. It was the same radio station. The other ones got the show that they said was being broadcast was a, a, a boarding event. She got the broadcast. And how can something like that happen? They asked me what happened. I said, I have no idea. <laughs> but it was a few weeks later, I lectured in Memphis at a Unity Church, and they drove all the way from Nashville to be there. And they said, it was three just nice old ladies. And they weren't making this up. And they said, we want you to know we are not making this up. We have the tape recordings to prove it. Now, what was going on there? Was it a kind of a lap overlapping of dimensions or something where this did exist in one and didn't exist in the other? Because this is what we have also been told that can blow your mind. I said, that's why I put this in the one book, because it is for those who want their binds bent, bent like pretzels. <laughs> because overall, the... In Australia at the moment is Professor James MacDonald, Professor of Meteorology at the University of Arizona. Officially, he was working for the US Navy, but in his spare time, he's checking many Australian reports of UFOs and comparing them with American reports. His aim is to see if the reports tally, in short, whether UFOs constitute a global phenomenon. phenomenon. In Melbourne, he's talking with Brian King. Professor MacDonald, what have you found here that's been of use to you? I've uh, investigated about uh, 50 or 60 cases uh, since I came down to uh, New Zealand and Australia. Extremely interesting UFO sightings. Uh, a lot of help from uh, local investigatory groups in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, and uh, have found, as I uh, go through these, that the type of sightings are essentially similar to those in the United States. What are the main similarities? Persons of uh, really quite high credibility reporting unconventional objects, discs, cigar-shaped objects, frequently at very low elevation, hovering uh, over sometimes urban areas, sometimes over cars, following cars. Same kind of uh, public reaction, uh, quite, a, quite a strong similarity to the American uh, reluctance to report them to official channels because of fear of ridicule. But uh, behind it all, a very large number, a, a, a very surprisingly large number, of these uh, sightings of quite uh, uh, unconventional uh, objects maneuvering in our airspace. You have been highly critical of your own government's attitude towards UFOs. Indeed, indeed I have, yes. The, uh, I've taken a very good look at the American official investigation program, Project Blue Book, run by the Air Force, and I have uh, uh, quite unequivocally described it to scientific colleagues back in the States as superficial and incompetent. Why has the government taken this attitude, in your opinion? It's uh, not, a, not a brief story, but it goes back to 1953 when a CIA-involved investigation was held. Uh, as a result of the extremely heavy wave of sightings in 1952, the CIA and Air Force became so concerned over the sheer number of uh, uh, reports that were tying up Air American intelligence channels that they wanted to get this signal out of the system, asked the Air Force, the CIA asked the Air Force for a, a debunking policy. The literal wording was to debunk the flying saucers, to decrease public interest in the UFOs. Uh, regulations were promulgated uh, very shortly that made it a crime uh, punishable with, I think it's $10,000 fine and or 10 years in prison to release any information at air base level on UFOs. And as a result of that, in a sequence of, of steady downgrading, uh, the uh, whole problem has uh, been essentially lost from scientific sight in the U.S. and nothing resembling any scientific investigation has been going on in the past uh, 15 years. Has this been typical of the attitude of most world governments? As nearly as I can uh, uh, tell, yes. Uh, there seems to be quite surprising similarity between the official Russian, British, Australian, Canadian, American, French, uh, Italian uh, pronouncements 
They all seem to uh, take the view that there's nothing to it, uh, that it's a lot of nonsense, that people see things, uh, and uh, that uh, it is not a real scientific problem at all, and I most heartily disagree with that. Uh, you have been as far as the United Nations with this problem. Yes, uh, about uh, two, three weeks ago, on the 7th of this month, of June, nearly a month ago now, uh, I uh, spoke to the Outer Space Affairs Group in the United Nations, urging uh, immediate uh, UN action on this problem. It seems to me that uh, uh, the UN is one of the best places to tackle the uh, international, the global aspects of the UFO problem, and all evidence now points to its being a truly global phenomenon. Uh, Utan made a statement at the time. I didn't get to see Utan. That was a busy day, June 7th. Uh, in fact, I had a date to see him at 4 o'clock, and if there was any one hour that was the peak of the Mideast crisis, 4 o'clock was it. So I unfortunately didn't get to see Utah. Uh, but uh, quite recently, a few days ago, I, I got a wire from a phone call from San Francisco uh, pointing out that uh, he had made a statement uh, to Drew Pearson, an American columnist, that um, aside from the Vietnamese War, the UFO problem is the greatest uh, international problem. And I sent him a wire. Uh, strongly endorsing his position, but disagreeing with him to the extent of saying that I believe it's the most important international problem. Why? We, we have in, in, in the UFO problem a, a very strange situation. Here for 20 years plus, uh, essentially similar phenomena have been reported all over the world, large numbers in the U.S., officialdom ignoring them, Air Force is ignoring them, and yet apparently a steady increase in the numbers of reliable reports from people in all walks of life seeing these objects that are not products of our technology, that are not meteorological astronomical phenomena, hovering at low altitude, increasing numbers in urban areas, and collectively we don't know what's going on. That's an extremely unwise situation, no matter how you view it. We do not know what is involved in this problem. There are no strong indications of anything resembling hostility. I see some faint indications of hazard and danger, but in general to to have this possibility that the world is under something resembling reconnaissance, possibly from some extraterrestrial source, and to go on about our petty ways collectively doesn't seem to me to be a wise situation. So I'm trying to get scientists and uh, governmental uh, uh, agencies to take a look at this at a, at a, at a highly uh, uh, accelerated pace. Professor McDonald, thank you very much. Yes, the President of the United States. The President of the United States. The President had authorized the establishment of a, a, a board of inquiry or an inquiry to inquire into issues of unidentified flying objects and that they were sending out somebody um, who I believe turned out to be a Mr... I think it might have been a Professor James McDonald. James McDonald, that's the one. Officially, he was working for the US Navy but in his spare time he's checking many Australian reports of UFOs and comparing them with American reports. His aim is to see if the reports tally, in short, whether UFOs constitute a global phenomenon. I met this Professor MacDonald. Basically, we did the same as I'm doing with you now. I just went through the story. And did he treat you respectfully? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, there is a recording of the interview. You saw it. There was a hovering motionless when you uh, saw well, it? Well, it, it did several things. It, it did hover at different times. It seemed to be able to accelerate and disappear out of sight, and then someone would see it uh, over in another part of the sky. It would move considerable distance very rapidly, and then it would move back again. My recollection is that it was very much he asked some prompting questions, uh, and that's all. It was basically for me to, to speak. And why did it disappear? Well, this is one thing we, we just don't know. It, it, it had vanished. All of a sudden, we, yeah. while you were all looking at it? No, it did one of these you know, accelerations and nobody could pick it up again. It was gone. There clearly is a report somewhere. What really strikes me is that 55 years on, these people are very certain about what they saw. And it just begs belief to me that in Australia, we've never had any official investigation. A teacher who claimed to see UFOs hovering over a Melbourne school says military officials threatened to have him fired if he ever spoke about the incident. Andrew Greenwood is talking publicly about the famous Westall High sightings 55 years ago for the first time in tonight's 7 News Spotlight program. Now an ordinary suburban school, but in 1966, Westall High students and teachers insist they saw UFOs triggering a massive government cover-up. They were threatening you. Oh, absolutely. I was threatened. Then a Westall teacher, Andrew Greenwood, speaks publicly for the first time to Spotlight. Mr Greenwood, Mr Greenwood, there's a flying saucer. On the Oval, he and 200 students saw three of them. 
It was a grey, almost cylindrical um, or cigar-shaped object. All these years later, the students draw what they witnessed. They claim one landed in a park, then took off. I could feel a heat and hear this buzzing sound and I could see purple lights all around it. Now, close to that landing area is a popular UFO-themed children's playground, but at the time, within 40 minutes, this area was swarming with military officials who warned witnesses never to tell anyone what they'd seen. They menaced the teacher at home. They told me that I was wrong, that I hadn't seen anything. And if he spoke up... Clearly you were drunk on duty and that will have to be reported to the Education Department and of course you'll lose your job. An official report into Westall just disappeared. And that is what I find most interesting of all, uh, that, that I was definitely being told to be quiet. I stood there absolutely transfixed and saw the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. And it took a while for me to sort of comprehend what I was actually looking at because I'd never seen anything like that before. There was three. The one that was closer um, was just in the sky, just sitting there. And um, then it went down, came up, and then banked on its side and took off really, really fast. It was moving away, so it had lifted off with the oval, okay, and it was moving away um, from us. And we just were gobsmacked, started chasing it. And my girlfriend and I sat on the fence, climbed up the fence, and just sat there and cried. We thought it was the end of the world. Before I came down into the paddock where the kids had seen this thing land, um, the paddock grass was about knee high. And as I walked through with pushing my bike with my uncle, I saw a group of about 20 people all huddled around looking at the ground, all looking at, at a circle, perfect circle, it was probably about four or five metres in diameter. The edge of the circle was perfectly formed. It wasn't as if you could, you know, cows or any other animals or even the kids had come in and just rolled around. It was too perfect. I mean, I know what I saw and in fact, I don't expect them to believe me because when it happened, I didn't believe what I was seeing because it wasn't possible. What I was seeing wasn't possible. I was called down to the headmaster's office and there were two men in the headmaster's office, very well-dressed gentlemen um, in suits. They weren't introduced to me in person and I don't know where they came from. From my references now as an adult, I would say they were Asia. So this is the actual office? Oh, this feels quite weird, yes. Yes. There was a desk down this side here and the headmaster was over here on that side and the two men were standing over there and I stood with my back to the window. Only one man spoke and he started off by, we, we'd like you to go through what you said happened yesterday. He was firing questions at me okay. fairly, fairly rapidly. Then we went into, oh, and we suppose you think you saw a flying saucer. And I'm like, well, I didn't say that. I said I saw an object. And, and we suppose you saw little green men. Can you remember how you felt once it was over? Um, when I was actually in the confrontation situation with, with the men, um, very, very, felt very, very angry. Um, when I came out, I think I burst into tears. They were certainly Australian government, and I think it was part of their job to keep everything quiet and to not let, let the facts come out. Um, they knew more than what they were, they were saying. It was their job to, to squash what was being seen. It was a bunch of kids that saw this, so we would be able to squash this down. Joining Ross and I now is former Westall student Tanya Vassi. You've never spoken before about this. This is the first time. You were one of the first to see that UFO hovering that day. What did you see? I saw a shiny two-storey disc. It certainly wasn't anything that we'd ever seen. So you had an incident that took place two days later where the headmaster came into the classroom and That's took correct. you away. What happened? 
Well, he took me to a room which I presume was a parent teacher interview little office and there were two gentlemen waiting there and um, I was with them probably for about 15 minutes um, being questioned. Did they say who they were? No. What, no, what they, nationality were they? Definitely American. Americans? Yeah. They didn't want me to speak of the incident to absolutely anybody and because it was in the interest of national security. So um, we want you to keep this under your belt and not discuss it with anybody. Did they try and explain to you what it was? Did they yes, even... they did. Yeah. Um, one of them actually told me that it was a very special weather balloon. Um, did you believe that? No, not even, no, not at the age of 12. I, I knew better. I know what I saw and it was definitely not a balloon. Can I ask you this, do you think it was something not of this world? Um, as an adult now, yes I do. Yes I do. Definitely. I no longer care what people think. I saw what I saw. I know what I saw. I was not the only one. Yeah. Ross, how significant is it that Tanya is coming forward with it's her story? It's very significant. The thing that really comes home to me, Tanya, is the fact that you corroborate that American officials were there trying to shut this story down. Absolutely. And, and it suggests there really was a cover-up and it was international. What is it that the Australian and American government had to hide in 1966 that 55 years later we still don't know what it was? It happened on the night of November 17th, 1986, 35,000 feet over Alaska. A pilot from Japan Airlines reported seeing a UFO, two times bigger than an aircraft carrier, flying dangerously close to his plane. He alerted air traffic control. This is the actual tape of their conversation that night. That is firm. We do not have anybody up there right now. Uh, can you give me the position of primary you're receiving? The pilot tracked the enormous UFO for 10 minutes, and then it vanished into the night stars. Shaken, the pilot completed his scheduled flight, only to learn that he was grounded. He is not alone. Air traffic personnel are pressured into silence as well. This controller, who has tracked UFOs on radar, feels strongly that authorities, such as the FAA, do more than just discourage the filing of UFO sighting reports. Only on the condition that his identity not be revealed did he agree to talk to us. Do you think there's a, actually a system in place to discredit people who might come forward? Yes. There was one in Fairbanks that uh, the controller saw something up to the north and uh, he reported it. And they, they made him look like an idiot. And he said, hey, forget it. I'm dropping the paperwork. I must have been mistaken. You know, some people who see this might think uh, you're seeing things. Uh, what would you say to them? I know what I saw. And uh, if they would choose to say that it was uh, something different, they weren't there. Dr. Richard Haynes, a retired NASA scientist who documents these sightings, helps pilots fight back. He defended the Japan Airlines pilot. Captain Tarucci followed the book. He did everything by the book. He reported the phenomenon, which were multiple objects, by the way, not just one. Uh, he uh, kept the airplane in control at all times. He had multiple eyewitnesses in the cockpit. And even at that, he lost his flying status. The chief medical officer for Japan Airlines told me Captain Tarucci was asked to uh, stop his flying duties because uh, the airline did not want to have um, pilots flying their airplanes who were seeing visual illusions. Even the FAA did not dispute Captain Tarucci's claims because air traffic control had confirmed the UFO on radar. I'm picking up a, uh, a hit on the radar, approximately five miles in trail, your six o'clock position, do you concur? They were very rational at the time when they landed at the airport. There was no appearance of any kind of drug or alcohol abuse or anything like that. 
They're uh, very sincere about their situation and their descriptions. And uh, basically, we have no reason to doubt them with regard to what it is they say they saw. But it was Dr. Haynes' extensive database of similar cases that helped Harucci get his job back. I went to bat for him, and I persuaded them, I think, that Captain Harucci is not all that unusual because of all these other cases that I have. Second, that the objects he saw are not all that unusual, as bizarre as they seem to be to most people. And third, he's a good pilot. Aviation pioneer Dick Russell's distinguished career includes 26 years as an air safety chairman and five years as spokesman for the Airline Pilots Association. He's flown virtually every passenger plane made since the DC-3. In the fall of 1956, Dick Russell was flying as a co-pilot when his flight captain pointed out the window. And I looked up and I saw an object which was uh, saucer in shape. It was approximately 50 or 60 feet in diameter. I was stunned and I said, what is that? And about that time, it zoomed across in front of my windscreen and stopped and then flew off at about a 45 degree angle, very high speed. I said, what in the world was that? He said, well, now you've seen one. But he says, you can't tell anybody because they think you're nuts. Ridicule and humiliation have been a constant for pilots ever since they first began to report UFO sightings during the Second World War. By the 1950s, although sightings were becoming more common, filing reports became a rarity. The phone will ring one night, and here's a senior captain of an airline who says, gee, I've got to tell somebody my story. And then when I assure him it'll be confidential, which it always is if he wants, uh, this wonderful story comes rolling out. With well over 2,000 cases in his computer database, Haynes has found a remarkable consistency in the descriptions of these objects. I have wonderful cases of the, air, the, the airplane is like here, and the object will be off the left wing, and then it'll hop over to the right wing. One very interesting case I investigated involving a commercial transport flying across the country at night. The captain uh, told me that he was on autopilot flying uh, at cruise altitude and cruise speed when all of a sudden the airplane began to fly by itself to deviate off, I believe, to the left-hand side. The alarmed pilot noticed that all three of his compasses were pointing to different headings. Then he saw a bright object hovering by his left wing. He observed it for several minutes before it darted off in a flash. That pilot did not report the sighting and spent years not talking about his UFO experience. Here in Los Altos, California, though, we found him. Neil Daniels is retired now and no longer silent about what he saw almost 20 years ago. Air traffic control in Boston said, uh, United 94, where are you going? And I, So I said, well, when we figure this out, I'll, I'll let you know. Whatever it was, it did cause a uh, disruption in the magnetic field around the aircraft to the, to the point where it did pull the aircraft off course. The airplane is the focus of attention of the phenomenon for some strange reason. Not the other way around. Later on, I mentioned it to my boss, and he gave me a, a ration about, well, bad things happen to people that have sightings like that. Neil Daniels wasn't sure what his boss meant by bad things, but bad things do sometimes happen to those who file UFO sighting reports. Pilots know now that uh, you can make reports all day long, and nothing will be done about it, nothing will be investigated. They'll take your report, and they lose it immediately. Military pilots have made reports many times. They've chased them. They have been uh, set out uh, uh, to, to chase it, to find out what they are. They come back with reports, and it's as far as it ever goes. In the early 1950s, Art Schaff was flying seven passengers, including two officers, from Eglin Air Force Base in Florida to Louisville, Kentucky, when he had a spectacular sighting. The next day, Schaff was thoroughly debriefed. There was a full colonel who was a, uh, chief of intelligence, and he's the one that called me in. I found out later that everybody was called in that was on that flight, and uh, everybody apparently saw the same thing. Back in those days, when more, more than one person saw, had a sighting like this, they, they used mass hallucination as a possible uh, answer to the whole thing. Schaff had been the first to notice the strange orange light hovering alongside the plane. He quickly pointed it out to his co-pilot. Out of nowhere, it's alongside of us. These three huge glowing balls in a triangle. And they and it stayed right with us as we pressed on. And the colonel said, Art, 
turn into it. And I said, forget it. And uh, he kept it up. So I, I very gingerly uh, dropped my left wing uh, into this whatever it was, and it's, it, it just took off like a streak. Dr. Haynes showed us case after case of other pilot sightings, all with minute detail about the encounters. Of course, many pilots don't believe in UFOs, but Dr. Haynes will often persuade them to carry his sighting forms along with them. And that will sometimes lead to a late night phone call from an excited new believer. And he says, Dr. Haynes, you're never going to believe what just happened to me over Lake Michigan. And I said, Phil, what do you think you saw? He said, there's no doubt in my mind that's a vehicle from outer space. Nothing could do what it did. It was as big as a football field, he said. 50,000 people could be on that thing, it was so big. And he showed me, moment by moment, as he's sitting in this position at first, where the object seems to be imaged on the windshield throughout the entire sighting. It disappeared behind the, the post here. It reappeared. It's a real object. It, it seemed to be under intelligent control. It had structure to it. They felt a slight shock wave at the nearest point when the object was doing its turn and then going away. Uh, by the way, he did not report this case to the authorities. He kept this to himself. Dr. Haynes says he wonders how many other pilots out there are just keeping it to themselves. One has to ask the question, when will there be a system in place that will allow pilots to file UFO sighting reports without fear of being grounded? There are other questions too. What are these objects? This wasn't an aircraft. They, you know, been around too many of them. Optical illusion, seven people saw it. You, you, you place your, your trust and your life uh, in uh, the hands of a pilot every time you climb on an airplane. But there have been too many sightings by people that, uh, well, have some credibility to uh, put it off forever. Can you honestly believe that this vast space that we have out here, with as many heavenly bodies that are up there, that we're the only people? Doesn't seem possible to me. UFOs were sighted over the White House two weekends in a row. Washington National Airport, the 26th of July, 1952. Pilot S.C. Casey Pierman, who had just taken off, asked the air traffic controllers if they could see what he could see. Howard Coughlin was in the tower at the time. He is now 85. The object was flat on the bottom, curved on top, with lights around the outside, and smaller than the, smaller than the airplane. The object was also detected on the radar screen. All the air traffic controllers on duty that night observed the UFO circling the airport. It went round and round several times it stopped out here and went up and then back down several times and then it went up and disappeared out to the west the air force also observed ufos on several occasions at different radar stations on two weekends jets were scrambled from andrews air force base in maryland without result. A jet would chase a UFO that failed to get within firing range. Was Washington in danger? It caused, uh, to say the very least, it caused uh, major concerns in the White House and President Truman. It caused major concern within the CIA when uh, Beetle Smith, who was the DCI, uh, thought that we had to investigate this. These UFOs were front page news. It even leaked out that the Air Force was trying unsuccessfully to shoot the UFOs down. Washington had to respond or run the risk of mass hysteria. The Air Force organized the largest press conference held in the United States since the end of the war. I explained that what we had seen was not couldn't have been temperature inversion because it 
went from one position to another very, uh, very quickly. We tracked the object on the radar and we calculated that the speed was round, around a thousand miles an hour. The Air Force Director of Intelligence, Major General John A. Sanford, was asked to conduct the press conference. He did well and was later made director of the then secret National Security Agency. We have received and analyzed between one and two thousand reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberrations. The headlines were reassuring. No menace. The CIA set up the Robertson Panel, a committee of scientists. Its report redefined the problem. What had to be taken seriously was no longer the problem of UFO sightings, but the problem of public panic. In October 1952, senior military personnel even claimed that the UFOs were interplanetary ships. Strong stuff. So why were the media generally so compliant in accepting the Pentagon's official version? It is undeniably true that the major media outlets within the United States have had a close working relationship with major U.S. intelligence organizations. This is a fact, uh, in particular with the CIA. We know this has happened back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s at the very least. Uh, we know that the CIA, for instance, cultivated at least 400 mainstream U.S. journalists without anyone's knowledge to um, do work on behalf of the CIA. And we're talking about people in places like CBS News, the New York Times, the Washington Post, all of the major outlets. Does this mean that the CIA controlled all of the news coming out of the U.S.? Well, no, not necessarily. But does it mean that they were able to influence the news in, in critical ways when they needed to? And the answer is clearly yes. Well, I think they did do some information management. I don't deny that. I think they were concerned that if the public knew that the CIA uh, was involved, uh, that that would uh, panic them even further. Uh, so that they tried to limit uh, uh, CIA's, or at least the public's knowledge of CIA's involvement. It went further than that. UFOs, or flying saucers, as they were now called, were given a makeover. No longer the Red Terror, they were now ridiculous, a subject for the tabloids and the illiterate. Kid stuff. But the sightings did not stop. October 4th, 1955, there was another very interesting sighting by a United States senator uh, traveling through the Soviet Union. And this senator was Richard Russell. Uh, I am uh, certain that I can carry every one of the southern and border states against General Eisenhower, and he has considerable strength in that area against uh, almost any other Democratic uh, candidate. Russell was one of the most powerful men in Washington. He was chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and had run for the Democratic nomination to challenge Eisenhower for the presidency. In 1955, Russell and two aides were traveling by train on a diplomatic mission in the Soviet Union. Unable to sleep, Russell looked out of the window. Russell saw an object rise, apparently stop, and then take off. It looked like a flying saucer. It looked round. Um, it, he was able to differentiate the various layers of this object. He called his two aides over after the object had gone, and sure enough, a second object they all saw rise and take off in similar manner to the first. Two years later, news of the incident trickled through to the press. Questioned by journalists, Russell said he'd been asked to keep it quiet. 
Only in the mid-1980s did UFO researchers obtain a court clearance releasing Russell's CIA files. He is convinced he has seen uh, UFOs. Uh, this uh, set, uh, sets off alarm bells in the, in the agency, as you can imagine. They went out and extensively interviewed uh, Senator Russell uh, to determine just what he had seen. And from those interviews, they determined uh, that Russell had not seen a UFO or some secret weapon, but had seen traditional uh, Soviet fighters in vertical climbs. Now, the uh, official CIA explanation for this was that Russell mistakenly saw uh, Soviet aircraft engaging in an uh, ultra-high um, high angle takeoff. But if you, if you read what he actually said in the report, it's, it's impossible to, to square these two explanations because he described clearly what was a circular craft. So how does Russell's description match the CIA's official conclusion? It's a good question, and I don't know the answer to it. Now, what's disturbing about this, if you really consider the implications, is that either the Soviets had UFO sightings or they had their own UFOs, if you really want to go to the ultimate conclusion about this. Well, of course, they were very concerned about what was going on in the Soviet Union. And what concerned them was, as the more increasing reports of UFOs came in, that they could find nothing in the Soviet press reporting UFOs. So they came, I think, to the conclusion that the Soviet government was hiding either the development of a secret plane or a secret weapon uh, and uh, wouldn't allow the Soviet people to report on UFOs. So this then alarms uh, U.S. policymakers. Our руководство рассматривало, что это не изученное явление, которое нужно изучать, что сделать летающую тарелку на обычных известных принципах не трудно, можно сделать, а что те принципы, которые там заложены, предполагали, что это, по-видимому, антигравитация, и вот на антигравитацию давались большие государственные деньги. Я этим делом занимался. Flying discs were also developed in the U.S. and Canada. In the United States, uh, there were around 1955 and 56 some media reports that came out that leaked regarding research into anti-gravity, into uh, breakthroughs that were supposed to be imminent any time, and uh, various experiments with disc-shaped airframes. In Canada, the government and then the U.S. Air Force funded Avro to build the Avro car. Shaped like a flying saucer, the Avro car was a complete flop. It would never rise more than two meters above the ground. It was actually a badly designed, unstable hovercraft. After a few test flights, both its prototypes ended up in museums. In any event, some believe that it was just a diversion to keep secret the real research project, Silverbug. Silverbug was planned capable of many times the speed of sound. Silverbug never flew. But some puzzling UFO sightings did have entirely tangible causes. To me, an interesting part of the entire uh, UFO story is what occurs in 1954-55 and then into the 60s when you have a major increase in UFO sightings and this comes from uh, not just uh, ordinary people but uh, airline pilots and controllers and so forth uh, that are reporting uh, seeing UFOs uh, at 60, 65, 70,000 feet. These years saw the first flight tests of the U-2 a CIA spy plane that could fly many kilometers higher than any other aircraft of the time. It was top secret and was meant to stay that way. The agency and the Air Force put together what they called Blue Book teams. And they went out and they would in interview airline pilots or controllers 
in an attempt to explain to those folks uh, that they hadn't really seen a UFO, but it was a natural phenomenon. For example, uh, if you had been a, a United pilot flying between San Francisco and, and L.A., and you'd reported an, an FOI, a, F, a UFO at, at, uh, at 60,000 feet, uh, and we would go out and explain that what you really saw at that time of day was the sun reflecting off ice crystals, which um, made an image of movement across the sky, but it really wasn't an object. When, in fact, it was the U-2 aircraft, which was silver. That's an absurd statement. Absolutely absurd. We're talking thousands of sightings. You're going to tell me that the U-2 aircraft can stop, maneuver, and look like a flying saucer <laughs> to all of these people? It's absurd. The U-2 aircraft flies at 80,000 feet and goes as straight as a string. You cannot mistake that every single, you know, all of these times for UFOs. A few times, sure, maybe. But in the quantity that Haynes was implying, this is ridiculous. To the Soviets, however, the U-2 really was a UFO, an unidentified flying object. Soviet airspace was crowded with various types of US planes, balloons, and the U-2, plus sightings of flying saucers and balls of light. Soviet radar did detect the U-2, but the military would not accept its existence. The first fighter pilot who did a ballistic vertical climb and reported a U-2 UFO was not given a medal, but got into trouble, like everyone else who saw UFOs. Anyone who wanted to remain a pilot was better off citing nothing. General Polkovnik at the time, Eugenie Savitsky, the father of the now deputy of the National Assembly, приехал, побеседовал с ним и сделал такой окончательный и не подлежащий обсуждению вывод. А у него немножко так с приветом человек захотел отличиться, захотел получить награду. Ничего этого быть не может. The Americans also sent spy balloons over the Soviet Union that were thought to be UFOs. But the Soviet Union's first UFO investigation was triggered by one of its own missile tests. A test so secret that not even the Commission of Inquiry was told the truth. It was maddening. I думаю, что боялись допускать это. Я думаю, а потому что я еще раз вам говорю, вот в этом заключается причудливость этого, что если это допустить, то тогда надо следующее, сказал букву А, надо делать Б и так далее, весь автомобиль проходить. На этом останавливали. Ну не знаем, не знаем. Завтра узнаем. UFOs and the U2. The problem was like navigating in a hall of mirrors. Here is a sensitive aircraft that is going to give the United States advantage in the Cold War against the Soviet Union, and to disclose it, you might lose that advantage. I think here you could understand uh, policymakers' reluctance to release this type of information. But wasn't everything the U.S. military found out about UFOs, if it did find out anything, kept from the U.S. public for the same reason? Was the U.S. government really lying to its people with the best intentions. In 15 years, at the latest, U.S. citizens would learn that the state also lies because it has dirty secrets. Such as the MK Ultra experiments during the 1950s. The CIA injected LSD and mescaline into unsuspecting people and studied their reactions. Why? The simple explanation to that, of course, is the Korean War, the capture of POWs, and the belief that the Soviet Union and the Communists were using mind-controlled drugs to brainwash uh, POWs and American soldiers. Uh, this then leads to a whole series of drug experimentations in the United States with LSD and the agency and uh, the army. Some of these terrible experiments were conducted on blacks because they were, quote, easier to get than guinea pigs. The CIA tried to reprogram brains and to produce schizophrenic, self-sacrificing assassins who did not know they were assassins. Electrodes were implanted in human brains and experiments pioneered in German concentration camps were continued. Some of the MKUltra experiments involved terminal sensory deprivation. In other words, horrific experiments in which someone was 
in a sensory deprivation environment until they died. This happened. It happened in Canada. Or, or, or people would lose their minds permanently. Uh, so these are horrific, horrific things. And so that the secrecy around them was absolutely essential, obviously. All this was revealed only because some CIA chiefs forgot to destroy psychiatric hospital accounts with their names on them. Through the Freedom of Information Act, Americans found out about things at least as unbelievable as the UFO documents that were later published by court order. Many people distrusted CIA assurances that the intelligence agencies had lost interest in UFOs in the late 1950s. They assumed that in hundreds of cases, such as the Redmond sighting, the lies were continuing. September 1955. During a night shift in Redmond, Oregon, police officer Robert Dickerson noticed a strange light in the sky. And right in this area, I seen a... It was a bright light. It was coming down. I, I thought it was something going to hit the ground. I didn't know what it was, you know. The object was longer than it was high, you know, something like a football. And it was bright. You could see it looked like, looked like heat waves coming off it. Uh, there was kind of, you know, some different, it would change colors a little bit. Dickerson drove to the airport where flight services specialist Laverne Wurtz was on duty. I was looking at it mostly, I think, from like a side view. If you took like two uh, saucers and put them concave like this and leave just a little space around it, that would be about the form that you would have. And I remember the lights kind of being on the rim, like on the rim of it, and it would change color there from like orange to kind of a yellow and then like Bob had mentioned, real bright, like kind of like an arc, and you could see the waves, kind of heat waves from it. The object was also sighted by a radar station, which alerted the Air Force. Within a few minutes, several jet fighters were dispatched, six in total. Radar led the fighters to the target. Then they saw it themselves on their screens in the cockpit. Well, it was shortly after that that they uh, contacted me on the uh, military frequency on the console, and uh, I talked to what I would assume was the lead pilot. At least two pilots saw the UFO. In the first light of dawn, they flew towards it. They made an approach to it, and uh, I know at least two of the jets did. And uh, I know at least one of them had to uh, take evasive action so they wouldn't be on collision course. And I remember another one stating that uh, we call it vortex. It's the uh, displacement of the air by something that uh, uh, made him uh, almost lose control. And he had to take corrective action in his jet to, to recover. The UFO ascended at great speed, but remained visible on the radar screens for a while longer. Then it left the range of the air traffic controllers at a height of over 15,000 meters. Roger Ramey, he's the guy who was holding that piece of paper. But then he was only a brigadier general. Now he's Major Roger Ramey. They have scrambled jets hundreds of times as a result of repeated sightings of unidentified objects. Hundreds of times. Now, are you telling me that the Air Force is scrambling jets hundreds of times after UFOs, but they're not a threat to the security of the United States? And you've ordered the pilots to shoot down the UFOs, and they're not a threat to the security of the United States. You can't believe how many jets crashed, how many planes disintegrated, how many jets were never found. More planes went up after the flying saucer than came back. And they're not a threat to the security of the United States. 
Now, it may be they're responding to our being nasty toward them. That's a separate question. How did he describe the object? He said it was about 200 feet across, probably 70, 75 feet thick. It has observation windows from the top section around. He moved around it again, and he said it's uh, metallic, dull aluminum in color. And he said, well, now it's trying to move away. I'm going to close in for a better look. And that's the last thing he ever said. The Air Force speculated that Mantell was suffering hallucinations caused by anoxia, the medical term for lack of oxygen. Was Captain Mantell coherent when he was talking to you? In my opinion, he had control right on through. I have worked people with anoxia, and in my opinion, he wasn't suffering. He was in full command of his facility. Perhaps the most important information Blackwell revealed were the names and ranks of other eyewitnesses in the tower. Oh, mercy. There were about three generals, Colonel Karen Coffey, base commander, Colonel Hicks, and the operations officer. It was jammed. When they said he was down, everybody abruptly left. Because the red tape gets awful. They didn't want to write all the reports. Didn't want to say they'd seen a saucer. Didn't want to say they hadn't seen a saucer. He was definitely chasing something that he felt was the, the national. Well, I think it more or less makes him a hero. Quentin Blackwell's revelations were a double-edged sword for the family who had traveled so far to meet him. He confirmed their worst fears, that the Air Force knew that Tommy was after more than a balloon and still chose to remain silent. But Blackwell also spoke out about Mantell's heroism, something his family had always known in their hearts. The Kinross incident occurred in, on November 23, 1953, when a uh, target was tracked at Kinross Air Force Base. An F-89 was sent to pursue this fast-moving unidentified object that was being tracked on radar. What was observed on radar was the merging of the blip of the F-89 with the blip of the UFO until only the UFO was left. It appeared to the control tower as if the F-89 and its pilot had simply been swallowed up into oblivion. I talked to a pilot who was in or on that base in 1953, and he told me there were two schools of thought. One was that the aircraft went intact into the lake, and because it went intact, it sank with no wreckage being seen on the surface. The other school of thought, the much larger school of thought, was that the flying saucer took it. That case is not in the Project Blue Book files. You would expect it to be there. The only reference in the Project Blue Book files is a note that this was not a UFO sighting, but it is in fact an aircraft accident debunking the entire UFO phenomenon. In 1970, the now deserted RAF base of Benbrook in Lincolnshire was active in the defence of the country. The base was home for English Electric Lightnings, fighter aircraft ready to be scrambled should any unknown objects enter our airspace. On Tuesday the 8th of September, the alarm came. An American pilot, Captain Schaffner, was first in the air to meet the UFO, but he never came back. It was a normal routine UFO sighting when the alarm was given, Captain Schaffner scrambled his lightning. And he was certainly a very experienced lightning pilot, and he loved to fly the lightning. He's 6,000 hours on fast jets, a very, very experienced pilot. He immediately took the few paces along here to his lightning and was airborne within seconds. Two other pilots were scrambled at the same time and sent out over the North Sea. Their job was to intercept a radar blip, which refused to answer repeated requests from the ground to identify itself. He reported that very bright lights. He was told then to proceed as close as possible and which is what he was doing when he was enveloped with a very very bright light now at this stage something some malfunction with the lightning so he's immediately withdrawn and instructed to ditch the story then is that a immediately he ditched and seemed to go down the ministry of defense issued a statement that the aircraft had broken up then stories start to conflict left, right and centre. The security blackout is immediately put over. The blip had gone off on the radar, whatever it was had gone. The lightning floated for a, a short while and gently went down. It was sitting on the seabed. Perfect. 
There was no mark other than on the nose, and the aircraft was, was in perfect condition. So and the canopy was closed. That's the sinister piece. The canopy was closed. The Ministry of Defence say this was a routine low-level night flight, and the aircraft came down due to pilot error. The pilot escaped on ditching, but was washed away by the tide. The release is between there, and within a split second, he's gone. Should that not fire, there's also on the top manual, so that it is impossible not to have fired. So for him to be missing, the seat still intact, and the canopy on and closed, means the mystery was absolutely unbelievable. Mankind, across cultures, is fundamentally in psychological denial on this subject. We don't know how to cope with it emotionally. We can't even begin to grasp it intellectually. There's just a wealth of information. And I would challenge anybody to, to disprove that. You see, anyone who says there's, there's no evidence to study has not looked. It's as simple as that. I've worked on the Gemini program uh, for the space program, uh, worked on the Apollo program, the Skylab program, on several aeronautical programs, and uh, I retired from federal service in 1988, and since then I have taught at a local university. Uh, from a science point of view, I can't ignore the data. Uh, the phenomena is just so beautiful, so powerful, so curious, that it demands some scientific involvement. And uh, I feel that the, the pilot sightings are very valuable because of a number of factors. The pilots are highly educated and trained for, for the first point. And what that means is that they have a career at stake. And they're not going to come forward with a report of some strange object or, or light off the you know, side of the aircraft or near the aircraft unless they've already eliminated all of the prosaic explanations. They're just risking their career to do so. And so uh, that's the first reason I like pilot cases. Another reason is that they're flying aircraft that are just packed with electromagnetic sensors on board of all kinds, you see or equipment that may be influenced by EM radiation. And so if we can find uh, some characteristic change in those instruments, or the radio, or radar, or the direction finder, or VORs, or DMEs, or various kinds of onboard cockpit instruments, we're learning something about the nature of the radiation that's, we think, related to the uh, phenomena in some way. And of course, that's what science is about then. Science can get interested in the phenomenon if it has some good firm data to work with. In some cases, uh, jet interceptors, Air Force interceptors uh, have been set up, in many cases actually, to help or in, to identify or investigate the phenomenon. Uh, but the pilot might ask for radar uh, coverage. Uh, did you see anything on radar? And uh, Captain Daniel's story includes that, that very event. Uh, did you see anything on radar in Boston? Air traffic control said, no, we don't see anything. But sometimes they do. I have many, many cases in my AirCat files where there is good positive visual radar correspondence. It's fair to say that a lot of sightings or reports are based upon misidentifications of natural phenomenon or advanced weapons, vehicles, or whatever. But I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about a class of events that have taken place after I've taken all those away. Dr. Richard Haynes is a former NASA scientist who has documented a large number of very special UFO sightings. His 3,000 reports were all filed by airplane pilots, like this one from a Japan Airlines captain whose close encounter of something was confirmed at the time by ground control. United 69 Heavy Strong, getting Japan Air 747. Presently in your 11 o'clock position, and he has traffic uh, following him, sir. It's unknown traffic. I keep you advised uh, when you're closer to him. I want you to see if you see anything with him. Pilots are very good observers. They're trained, they're highly motivated. An example of the reliable sightings in Dr. Haynes' files came from Captain Neil Daniels, a top United Airlines pilot with 35 years experience. I was flying a uh, DC-10 from San Francisco to Boston. We were flying at 37,000 feet. When the airplane started to turn to the left, uh, I looked out the window to, to clear, as all, all pilots do, and I saw this, this very bright light, this object off to the left wing tip of the airplane. But the thing that uh, what I found interesting was uh, it had disrupted all three of the compasses on board the aircraft. 
Air Traffic Control in Boston uh, said, United 94, where do you think you're going? And I said, well, I'll let you know when we figure it out. The disturbance of the compasses represents one of the many patterns Dr. Haynes has been able to study by comparing the 3,000 cases. So I have a whole chapter which deals with the pilot flying along, minding his own business usually, and if something comes up along the, the, the near the airplane and does this right around the front of the airplane, it corkscrews. Extraterrestrial is a, a an attractive hypothesis because then we can postulate that they're maybe a thousand years ahead of us in, our, in their science. One of the aspects I'm very interested in is if it is extraterrestrial, what they're up to. Why are they here? Captain Schmidt, Swisser. The radar station at Maastricht informed us that a UFO was proceeding in a northerly direction. It then turned towards us at a speed to four to 5,000 kilometers an hour, very fast indeed. Eventually it stabilized in relation to our position to three nautical miles to our right at 45 degrees. That's about five kilometers from us. We put on the headphones and looked to the right and suddenly there was uh, an immense flash in front of us. I hadn't seen anything like it. Very fast and very intense. The radio didn't give any signal. Nothing at all. Maastricht told us that the object stopped for a minute behind us and then went south at great speed. It was traveling four to five times the speed of sound. Later I read the report of the radar controller. After checking the data, he wrote the speed was double that, which means it was 10 to 12,000 kilometers an hour. It went away in a southerly direction. It returned and went away again. It was as if it was playing hide and seek with us. The UFO was enormous, very fast, and it was flying at 10 to 12,000 kilometers an hour. It was seen on radar and seemed to play with the airliner, not behavior that you would expect of a military or experimental aircraft. And this is how another Swiss air pilot explained his experience. Captain Peter Bircher, Swiss Air. Suddenly the object, which had flown with us for a while, veered and then at top speed disappeared turning through 90 degrees. I think that this behavior would exclude a natural explanation of the phenomenon, since the object resembled no known flying object. It was practically suspended in the air in front of us. It then went away at high speed, veering at 90 degrees in relation to our route. No known flying object can do such a thing. Many civil pilots are reluctant to talk about their sightings of UFOs. They don't want to be ridiculed, and often they want to protect their flight crew. Military pilots are bound by official secrecy, for the duration of their service. Captain Duvestal, Swiss Air. At first, we thought we were seeing a star, or at least we believe it to be a shooting star. But straight away I told myself that it wasn't possible because of its speed. It fell gently to the horizon and then oscillated a little to the left, and then to the right, and then left and right. It then returned to its original position. All of this in less than 30 seconds. That's far from normal. Have you spoken about this to military pilots? I've spoken to American military pilots in Alaska. They told me that they've reported many strange things in those out-of-the-way places, but that they weren't allowed to discuss these things. So you think that the military pilots know more than they can uh, tell about UFOs? Have they also observed this kind of stuff and just can't speak about it? Oh, sure. Sure. 